Hello, it's February and at last we are nearer the spring equinox than we are the winter equinox. Hooray! And in today's video, Jessie looks at one of her favourite cover crops. Tom looks at something you can forage this month. Niall shares with us one of his favourite gardening tools. Mandy looks at another perennial vegetable. And Tao and Hoppy Wimbush share their thoughts on winter. But first of all, let's catch up with JB with an update of how the chilli seeds that he planted last month are doing. On the 31st of December, I tried sowing my chilli seeds as early as I thought I could possibly get away with. And I'm going to show you how they're doing today and give you a few little kind of tips about what to be doing at this stage of growth. In my earlier clip, I said one of the things that you need for chilli plants is patience. Some of these seeds took 28 days to germinate. Some of them just germinated a few days ago and I was really worried for a long time. A lot of the seeds took a good three weeks. So that's with perfect conditions, really good heated propagator. So if your chili seeds are taking a little while, just remember, be a little bit patient. They can be quite finicky. But as soon as those seeds do germinate, it's time to get them under either a grow light or on a south facing windowsill. They want as much light as possible. And what you'll see over time is those tiny little slender cotyledons should start to beef up. I, I just love it when they do that. It's, it's really nice to see. And you just wanna make sure that the plants aren't getting too leggy. Even with perfect light, they will shoot up a little bit and it can take a bit of practice to get your grow light to kind of the right setting. So just make sure you're monitoring the plants as regularly as you possibly can. And the other thing you're gonna to wanna to do as soon as your seeds start germinating is get some good airflow on them. This really helps to strengthen the plant. First and foremost, it will make a nice, strong chili plant. But what will start to happen as you get your fan on, your airflow, it will start to dry out the other seed modules. So if you're growing in a module tray like me, there's a really quick and easy way that you can get around this. And I use these little shot glasses. <laughs> they just sit on the module and it just keeps everything in there nice and humid and moist and gives the seed what it needs to germinate. Some of these seedlings getting on for two weeks old now, and you can see they are still absolutely tiny. We're just starting to get the first leaves coming through, which is a really good sign. But these are gonna stay in these module trays for quite a little while yet as they start to slowly grow. And once their roots start coming out the bottom, that's when you know it's time to pot on. And we'll be back with JB in a couple of months to see how those plants are growing. Now I've hardly been out to the polytunnel for the last couple of months, so I've done very little in it. I have been in and checked and watered a couple of things uh, a few times. So my plan today is to bring some bulbs that should have been planted in the autumn. Oh, sorry plant. <laughs> bulbs that should have been planted in the autumn. I'm going to put them in here for now so that I've got the wheelbarrow to use because uh, I have taken delivery of a couple of loads of wood chippings, which means that I can finish covering these pathways for this year, I hope, um, get the wood chips down so I'm not walking around on the weed suppressing membrane. Some of the weed suppressing membrane uh, is a woven plastic fabric, um, but then once I had discovered this really lovely uh, cornstarch based a material. I started using this and uh, it's great stuff. It uh, starts decomposing in about three years which is plenty of time to really suppress the weeds here and let this garden get started. Uh, so I'm very pleased to have discovered that. Uh, I'll leave a link to where I get that from uh, in the video description. Uh, in my gateway, I have these pieces of wood, both on the inside and the outside, uh, to stop rabbits getting in under the gates. But it actually makes for a very long process of getting in and out of the gate. When I can think of something that is better, I will. So this rabbit-proof netting goes uh, down and then across the ground to stop uh, rabbits digging in. but. There is a gap uh, under the gate which they could squeeze under 
and because we're on a slope uh, there would be more gap at one end than the other so it's a nuisance but yeah there it is Rather than cover the perennial uh, weeds and grasses with the wood chips, I'm just lifting those first. My plan with this is to leave it on the ground for two to three years, uh, at which point it will have broken down uh, nicely and then I can scoop it up and add it into the vegetable beds, increasing the organic matter in there and then I can put down new wood chips and start the process all over again. And now Jesse at Plot 37 looks at another way to add organic matter and nutrients into your soil with something that you can do in late autumn and late winter and early spring. So around now. Field beans. So field beans are a type of broad bean or a fava bean, but whereas the ones that we normally grow for a bean crop, they've been bred and rebred to have really large tender pods. The field beans are kind of like the original version. They do produce pods if you let them, but they're much smaller. One advantage of them over a broad bean or a fava bean is that they are just a much tougher plant. So if you can't grow broad beans in your climate, people do often grow the field beans it's just that much tougher. But in a milder climate, they're generally grown as a cover crop or a green manure. And their main use as a green manure is that they are nitrogen fixers. So they work in collaboration with a fungus which is naturally found in the soil. So the beans can take the nitrogen from the air and then store it in the nodules of the roots in the soil, which then makes the nitrogen available for subsequent crops. That's particularly useful for plants which have a very high nitrogen need, like brassicas. So I often plant my field beans in the bed which I'm planning to grow my brassicas in later in the year. But that's not their only advantage. They do have really, really strong roots which can help if you've got poor soil structure, if you've got really, really heavy clay soils or indeed sandy soils that need a little bit more bulk in them. They produce a lot of top growth which is either incorporated directly into the bed that you've grown them in or it can just be used in your compost heap but whatever, it, the organic matter is not wasted. They also perform the role of a classic cover crop preventing the nutrients leaching from the soil either during the winter or between crops and they also have one extra little gem about them which is they are edible and delicious. I sow field beans twice a year. There's the autumn ones which I plant about October but it can be anywhere between September and November. You just want to give them enough time to have established and be quite a robust plant before the cold really hits. And I'll sow another lot in spring around March but it can be anywhere sort of February, April depending on your climate. If you're sowing the field beans over a wide area you can scatter sow them and then lightly fork them in. Because I garden in relatively small raised beds I tend to hoe the surface of my soil first and and then taking a handful of field beans, I've just pushed them into the soil with my thumb. As a rough idea, they want to be about 10 centimetres apart, maybe five centimetres down. Perfect spacing is not going to affect the end result. Something to bear in mind uh, that I found is if you're sowing them late or early, so like a November time or the February, tends to be a time when there's not a lot else around for rodents to eat and they do tend to go for them. So if you're sowing them quite late in the year or quite early in the year, it's probably a good idea to cover them until they've at least started to come up. Because you can find that significant areas of the beans you've just sown have become a mouse's dinner. So just bear that in mind. On the subject of pests and diseases, they're pretty resilient to most things. But like a lot of the legume family, they are a magnet for blackfly. However, if you can bear to leave a patch to get completely caked in them, the end result is a little ladybird factory. I have never seen the number of ladybird larvae on anything as I have on aphid infested field beans. Uh, if they provide all of those other things and you can also eat them, what's not to love? So there's two kind of edible parts. Firstly, the leaves, which is what I use them mostly for. You can use them as a salad crop or cook them down like a spinach. The tips are where they're most tender. You can start picking out the tips when they're really quite small. It just creates a bushier plant. And particularly the ones that you sow in late autumn provide something really special for overwinter. 
Uh, you have access to a fantastic little leafy green. So it's not going to get got by the frost. It can just be outside and you have tender, fresh new shoots, which taste a lot like pea shoots. In the summer, they can be used in salads or whatever, but in the winter, veal bean top risotto, bliss. It's got that really fresh flavour of spring, which is a flavour I really, really miss in the depths of winter. It's absolutely beautiful. But it's not just the tops, you can also eat the beans. I don't use them quite in the same way that I would a broad beans. I tend to dry them and then use them in soups later on in the year. So yeah, unless you are actually interested in harvesting the beans, you generally want to cut them down before they start flowering. I tend to do the chop and drop style. So once they've reached a certain height but before they flower, and normally about a month before I want to plant my brassicas into that bed, I would chop them all the way down to the ground into little pieces and leave it scattered on the top of the bed and let the worms take it down. You can also just dig the whole lot into the soil to add the organic matter that way. One of the things that I like most about doing the chop and drop method is that when you chop them down and you leave the roots intact, you get a second flush of really beautiful, soft, tender, marvellousness on top of it. So you get a whole nother wave of beautiful soft leaves to eat before the demise of the plants. So yeah, field beans, they are tough as old boots. You can grow them practically the whole year round and you can eat them. What's more to love? Thanks, Jessie. I didn't sow any field beans in the autumn. It's something I think I'm going to be doing in the next month or so. And if you haven't discovered Jessie's channel yet, uh, I'll leave a link in the video description. Head over to her at Plot 37 and follow her adventures at her allotment. And next, uh, let's go and meet Tom Radford. So Tom is new to YouTube, but is a well-known face on TikTok uh, and Instagram. And Tom is going to talk to us about something that you can forage this month. What can you forage? What's left? Well, a few things, a few of the uh, last of the mushrooms, maybe a few velvet shanks, a few winter oysters, possibly a few winter chanterelles friends of mine still finding. There's other things like uh, ground ivy um, and there's, there's nettles. Now nettles are a love or hate thing. They're a marmite thing, aren't they? Nettles. Because what do you associate nettles with? Yes, they do sting you, but there's a lot more to nettles than you might think. First of all, how do they sting you? Well, on the leaves and on the stem, there are little tiny sort of transparent needles. Um, and when they touch your skin, they pump formic acid and histamines into your skin, which swells up into a sort of red lump, which obviously stings at the time. And then later on can be itchy. Now, how do you get rid of a nettle sting? Use a dock leaf, I hear you shout. Well, <clears throat> I used to do that myself. And in my mind, it seemed to work. However, there is actually no scientific evidence that dock leaves do get rid of nettle stings. Um, and I have actually tested this myself. Um, last summer I made a film where I actually stung myself to try and find out. Now, they do help. Um, and in fact, you can use a dock leaf. You can, instead of just rubbing it on the wound, you can actually pull it out and there's like a sort of gel, like a sort of balsam-like sap in there. And that's actually a little bit better and it does soothe it. However, if you actually really want to get rid of the sting, you want to use the leaves of a greater or lesser plantain. Not a banana plant, greater or lesser plantain. Um, they have these small leaves which um, have an, a natural antihistamine in them. So you can chew a bit and you can rub it on there and that will make it go away faster because it's a proper medicine. What else do we know about nettles? Are they edible? Absolutely they are. You can eat the whole plant. You want to eat them when they're young. Don't eat them when they're old because they're a bit woody. And don't eat them when they're in flower because they become a laxative and your stools may somewhat lack structural integrity as a result. If you want to turn yourself into an indoor muck spreader, then by all means fill your boots. Um, but they are very edible. You can make beer with them. You can make soup with them. You can make you can make your pasta green with them. You can make tea with them. They're incredibly healthy. They've got lots of iron in them and vitamins. Um, so they are quite remarkable. They're not just a weed, you know. Not only that, but they've got medicinal properties. For years, people have used nettles for things like urinary tract and bladder problems, for arthritis. They really is a long list of things they can do. I know people that drink nettle tea on a regular basis and they swear by the effects of it because nettle seeds, apparently, when they're dried out, can be used as a stimulant. Now, I did try this myself. I've got a big bag of them. <laughs> I ate quite a lot of them and didn't notice any effects, but some people swear by it. But wait, there's more. 
If you're going to use a plant for medicine, I always do say this, uh, do your homework first, don't just take my word for it. What else do we know about nettles? Well, folklore. Everybody loves a bit of folklore. I love a bit of folklore. Now, in folklore, nettles were associated with Loki, who was the god of mischief, as you may know. Loki had a nettle net. He had a net made out of nettles, and many would use it for lots of nefarious sort of Loki mischievous behaviour. However, there is a shred of truth in this. I'm not sure about the gods. However, you could make a net out of nettles because nettles is, is used as a fibre. It could be used for sailcloth and most of the things that hemp would be used for. It's so versatile. What else in folklore? Ah, yes. Well, in another area of folklore, have you ever heard of elf arrows? Now, elf arrows were supposed to be little elves shooting arrows at you, which gave you random pain. Other people called it air venom. They had this idea that venom was going through the sky just randomly and was giving people pain. So nettles could protect you against this. So if you see a little tiny sort of Legolas running around in the grass with his sort of blonde hair and his pointy shoes and his pointy ears firing arrows at you, wave some nettles at him. Just get out, get out. You're on your way, Legolas. We're not having any of that. I've got some nettles. Also, nettles used to grow around fairy houses apparently and the nettles would protect you against the fairy magic. Now I always thought fairies were supposed to be really friendly things if you believe in fairies which I've not seen any evidence to actually convince me of that but if you do apparently the magic can actually be quite naughty and well not about nasty but you need to be protected from it. You don't need fairy magic with all the other problems we have these days and nettles will protect you from them. Now nettles are very easy to recognize. Uh, Heart-shaped leaves with the serrated edges you must have seen them before. Only thing you can really confuse them with possibly mint, possibly lemon balm, possibly dead nettle, which is a different plant. Um, if you're not sure, just grab it with your hand. If you get stung, that's nettles. Now, a little bit of housekeeping. If you're going to eat something from the wild, be it flora or fauna or mushroom, please be 100% sure before you do, um, because you know, I like to give a guide by also looking books. I ask friends, I check all sorts of sources and I try to be sure. You must be sure before you do it because it can go wrong. Nettles, you're amazing. You should be running the country. I asked Tom to join this month's collaboration because his videos just make me smile, uh, they make me laugh and they're packed full of really good information. So I'm now out here uh, by the Rose Arch Tunnel uh, and I'm clearing the weeds from in this bed. It's also got a lot of spring bulbs in it that I put in last year and I'm clearing these weeds out ready to mulch um, over the top of this and I use, I was going to say used duck bedding and it is used duck bedding but it's very freshly used duck bedding. Uh, it hasn't been stacked at all. It would be better if it was stacked. Good grief. <laughs> Look at the roots on that. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, it would be better if we could have stacked it for a bit but I simply don't uh, don't have the time and so what I do is literally as I empty um, the duck house of bedding um, I clear the next section of weeds and come and put that used duck bedding on it. It's going to suppress the weed growth, uh, lock in the moisture and help me increase the depth uh, of organic matter in this raised bed. And I've also brought out uh, some of those bulbs that I carried uh, into the polytunnel earlier on. These are Allium, uh, I think it's Gigantium, these ones. Uh, anyway, they're going to do a very tall stem with a big, big purple uh, flower head on the top of them. I should really have got these in uh, in the autumn, but I didn't, but it's not too late. Uh, they might be a bit later uh, in flowering than they would have been otherwise. But these poor old things uh, have put out plenty of roots. They're even starting to grow shoots. So I'm going to get them into the ground. I've got enough to do uh, four on each side. So there are already some in here. Um, and so I want to add to that. So I'm not being terribly uh, scientific, mathematical or logical about where they go. I'm just going to put four in this side and four in that side. And one of the other things that I planted in here last year uh, was some ordinary onions, eating onions. Onions produce really lovely flower heads. So they send up a central spike uh, with a whole load of little flowers on the top of it. They're really attractive to pollinators and they give a really nice display. Now I spent quite a lot of money on these Allium Gigantium bulbs and they will put up a flower head that's really quite tall. But uh, these onions will also send up a flower spike. It won't be as tall, 
and it's going to be creamy white rather than purple. But all you need to do uh, is make a hole and plant your bulbs and really they need almost twice as much soil uh, above the bulb as is there. I'm probably going to plant them to about this deep so I can see a little bit of the green um, but well and truly in. I will need to be very careful because the bulb is super squashy. Uh, you can see uh, it's already starting to produce roots so it's really ready to get straight into the ground and start growing properly. I was talking to Niall uh, the other day about pulling out all of these by hand and he was saying that he uh, has a favourite tool uh, that he likes to use in the garden and I'm really rather envious. Everyone needs that one go-to garden tool that just seems to work for them and it's certainly a personal thing. So this isn't going to be some advert for a brand, just an honest recommendation for something that I think is really great to use. If you've already got one, I bet you're going to agree with my suggestion. And if you don't, go out and get yourself a mini hoe. Now, I know that some people use a trowel for a ton of jobs like weeding, but I find that it's just too blunt an instrument, both in terms of its actual dull edges, but also just how it doesn't really perform for me. So enter the mini hoe. Complete honesty, I treated myself to one of these without really knowing whether I actually needed it and moreover whether it would actually be any good in the garden. Now it goes everywhere with me, as in it goes everywhere or at least everywhere in the garden, not everywhere. It's not that special. It is special, it's not that special. But things that I use this super little bit of kit for for reason one, let's peel back the netting on my bed full of purple sprouting broccoli. And it's because it's the obvious weeding. I like to keep this tool as sharp as a scalpel. And the way it's designed, it feels that precise too. This absolutely slices through weeds like a hot knife through butter, but it's small enough to slip in between your plants so that you don't actually cut them down at the same time. Number two. Weeding again, but in a different way. This little hoe is actually great for cutting deeper rooted weeds out. I'm sure this isn't technically the correct way to use this. So if this offends or upsets you, I'm sorry. But what I'll do is I'll plunge the blade of this really deep into the soil, cutting the weeds from down underneath and getting lots of the root out at the same time. And number three, creating drills. Because of the point and how the blade sits at 90 degrees to the handle, this is really what I think the most comfortable and effective way that I've found to create drills, which then I can drop seeds into. This isn't crazy expensive either. It obviously depends on your budget and what you consider expensive or cheap, but this high quality little mini hoe set me back about 18 euro, which for that amount of versatility and just plain handiness makes it money well spent as far as I'm concerned. I use this in all of my raised veg beds in large containers and anywhere where I need something that's going to work really well and be really precise. If you're looking for a garden implement that's going to make your life easier, look no further. One of the things about living uh, so high up a hill is that it's very often cloudy and you're kind of in the clouds. So as you're gardening, um, well, as I'm gardening, I get <laughs> very wet, but I don't realise how wet I'm getting until I stop. Anyway, <laughs> I'm now thoroughly soaked. But last summer, uh, I went to visit Mandy Barber uh, of Incredible Vegetables down in Devon. And so uh, now we will continue our look at some of the perennial vegetables that you can grow in your garden. Sea kale is another really good one for the perennial vegetable garden. And although it's uh, found on the coast, um, it will grow well in any sort of well-drained garden soil. And um, the fantastic thing about sea kale is that you have three harvests from it, so you can um, once your plant's established, you can uh, force it in the early spring, a bit like you would force rhubarb by putting a bucket over it. And you get uh, really lovely tasting uh, sort of blanched sea kale shoots. And then you can um, take the bucket off 
allow the plant to grow and you have a first harvest of leaves which you can use just a bit like um, an ordinary kale leaf, very tasty, tasty, very tender. And then, and then the third harvest you get, um, which is really exciting, and it's also a plant that I think you can consider as a perennial broccoli alternative, is that um, before the flowers open, you get lots and lots of um, mini florets that you can harvest, and so you can cut them off like small, small broccolis. So I, I really like the idea of um, alternatives to uh, you know to annuals and biennials where you go well actually I can have florets from Turkish rocket I can have florets from sea kale what a, what a great idea and then there is actually a fourth harvest which is a, um, slightly strange but you can uh, you can actually eat the the seed pods before they turn brown and they're like they look like little green peas and I know uh, they are edible um, and um, I think you could possibly pickle them even you know a bit like you'd pickle nasturtium buds or something something like that but I think for the for the early shoots the leaves and the florets um, is the best best three parts of, of growing sea kale and they're exquisitely beautiful and the flowers smell of honey as you waft past there's just like amazing scent of honey and the bees love them so it's like win-win situation. <laughs> One of the other things I want to do before the end of the month is to plant uh, the last of the bare root trees that I'm putting in this year. So this is a cherry tree and it's going up in the orchard and um, it arrives bare rooted so this means it hasn't got soil around the roots so um, I have kept these wrapped, I've given them a good drink, I've kept them moist uh, so that uh, the whole plant doesn't dry out. Uh, so I need to uh, find exactly where I want it to go. Uh, dig a hole, not too large uh, and not too small, and then I'm going to plant it at uh, the, pretty much the same depth that it was before, uh, and maybe a tiny bit deeper, but no deeper uh, than the uh, join here. So you'll see there is uh, the rootstock there and then uh, the cherry tree that goes up there. Uh, so I'm going to be planting uh, at this level and making sure uh, that they are, uh, all the trees are uh, well firmed in and uh, on windy sites to stake them. Now, I've got to say that we haven't staked any of the trees on this site. And what instead I have done is I have lent them uh, in towards the wind. So I'll do it this way. So I've lent them in and then the wind comes up this way. And then the worst that's going to happen is that the wind will gradually straighten the tree up. Um, <laughs> perhaps I should stake them. Uh, so I'm going to advise you to stake uh, trees and you put a stake in at a 45 degree angle to, uh, to your tree uh, into the wind. So you put it that way and then fix it there. You don't want to fix it high up because you actually want this tree to move in the wind uh, because that will allow it to build some strength. But anyway, that's another task that I want to try and get done uh, well, in the next week. When I went to visit Tau and Hoppy Wimbush uh, back in the summer, we had a conversation about how uh, we get through the winter. I love the winter. I love that dark retreat space. Like this time of year, here we are in the summer, it's all flat out, super busy, super bright, super exciting. And I really look forward to that dark time when I can kind of retreat and go within. And I kind of know having really surrendered to the dark that in the middle of the dark, in, 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 in the, at the kernel, if you can really just like surrender to it, in the kernel there is a bright, bright light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, winter is a time for snuggling up in front of my fire. It's about really connecting with the deeper dreams and wishes that I have. It gives me time and space to dream and to vision and also it gives me time to craft like I do all my mm. crafting in winter I love to create but create just for myself I'm not creating for anyone else it's just for me and that time of really early nights when it goes dark at four o'clock in, in the day um, in the UK anyway I actually really enjoy that 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 time of giving myself deep, 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 deep rest. 
Yeah. Deep rest for my body. Um, deep rest from socialing, you know, being around social people and coming into a place of being my own best friend. So I really, yeah, I really love that time. It's yeah. a time of deep nurture for me. Yeah. And if you, and if you embrace it in that way, it's, yeah. it's over in a flash. It will. And before know, you know sometimes it. Sometimes in five February, it's not <laughs> over by a flash. Like, oh my God, will this rain ever end? <laughs> that is the truth of it. Yeah. And at the same time. In February, the snowdrops are out. In February, the snowdrops are out. And, you know, I, I, I know when I'm in that dark place of winter and it's freezing cold, sometimes I can't even imagine if it can ever get warm again. And how can the air ever be warm and dry? But it always comes around. There's always a cycle to this life. It's, it's just the nature of nature. Now, if you're itching to get growing something this year, there are some seeds that you can sow now. And I've made a video and I'll leave a link on the screen and in the video description. But if you click on this, it'll take you straight through to that video.